is Hans Verbeek. Everybody knows about climate change and a lot of people are aware about the importance of tropical rainforests for their CO2 uptake from the atmosphere. However, a lot of people don't know that something is going on in tropical rainforests since the last 30 years. Lianas, which are woody climbing plants, are increasing fast in abundance in biomass. And with my team, Cave Lab, we are trying to investigate the impact of this liana proliferation on the growth of tropical rainforests and as such on climate change. This project, called Tree Climbers, is the main activity of our group. With Cave Lab, we are doing research in the field of computational and applied vegetation ecology. We are building computer models to simulate the biogeochemistry and the ecology of ecosystems, mainly tropical forests. But to build good models, we need high quality observations and therefore we are collecting field data in various ecosystems around the world. We are, for example, monitoring carbon stocks in the heart of the Congo Basin. We are studying functional diversity in a reforestation project in Ecuador. We are measuring the water use of lianas and trees in French Guiana. And we are observing the 3D forest structure with terrestrial LiDAR scanning in forests in Panama. Geobia 2016, het congres Geographic Object Based Image Analysis. Een tiental jaar terug, in 2006, hebben wij met een kleine groep remote sensors besloten om rond het thema van Object Based Image Analysis een congres te gaan organiseren. Ondertussen zijn we dus met een goede 250 wetenschappers wereldwijd die met deze jonge wetenschapsdiscipline heel actief bezig zijn. En wat doen wij nu eigenlijk? Wel, wij gaan beeldmateriaal, afkomstig van UAV tot en met satellietbeelden, gaan interpreteren op basis van objecten en niet op basis van pixels. Objecten zijn eigenlijk groepen van pixels, aaneengesloten pixels, die homogeen zijn in een aantal karakteristieken. En door onze omgeving te gaan moduleren met een netwerk van aan elkaar gekoppelde objecten over verschillende schaalniveaus heen, zijn we dus in staat om onze landschappen, onze omgeving niet alleen beter te gaan modelleren, maar ook beter te gaan begrijpen en inzicht te krijgen in hoe die verschillende componenten eigenlijk onderling functioneren en hoe ze onderling gerelateerd zijn. Door de implementatie van het GeoBia-concept ben ik in staat om vraaggestuurd onderzoek uit te voeren binnen een breed gamma aan maatschappelijk relevante toepassingen. Met betrekking tot milieu-integriteit, bijvoorbeeld ruimtelijke analyse van ecosysteemdiensten, met betrekking tot volksgezondheid, bijvoorbeeld habitat- en risicokartering van dichtevectoren, maar ook met betrekking tot lokale en regionale klimaatsproblemen, bijvoorbeeld stedelijke gitten. Dus in lijn met wat de universiteit of de slogan is van de Gentse Universiteit Dare to Think, is mijn slogan voor de toekomst Think Beyond Pixels. Goedemiddag iedereen, mijn naam is Pieter de Fremme en mijn onderzoek gaat over uh, in de ruime zin algemene en toegepaste botanie of meer specifiek over het effect van klimaatverandering uh, op uh, de dyma dynamiek van planten. Wat dat we hier zien is een experiment uh, waarbij dat we het effect van klimaatverandering simuleren op uh, bosplanten. Dus we hebben plotjes waar dat we opwarming simuleren met kleine serretjes. We hebben plots waar dat we nutriënten toevoegen uh, onder de vorm van stikstof. En we hebben plots waar dat we deze lampen uh, ophangen om uh, eigenlijk een verandering in bosbeheer te simuleren. Alsof dat het kronendek uh, zou meer open gemaakt worden. Oké, okay, hier zijn we at another day in the office in Norway. We are heading on to this top where we are going to look at some data loggers and we have some experiments there where we um, where we are looking at how 
plants are changing with climate, changing their distribution up the hill. So we now inventory the plant species on the summit and we have several uh, we have inventoried several summits in this area and what we see is that across the years more and more plant species of lower altitudes are coming gradually in uh, up these slopes as a result of climate change. Uh, we are now in the EcoStrip project where we uh, try to assess the effects of shrub encroachment on the plants growing here and on the carbon in the soil. So because of climate change more and more shrubs are coming in here. This area is also very actively used by sheep farmers and so the sheep interact with the grass of course by grazing and that affects also the effects of these shrubs and the other plant species to climate change. So now we are standing at an exclosure, so with this cage we exclude sheep grazing grass from, uh, from uh, plants, grass and plants growing in this, uh, in this area. Water erosion continues to be a significant environmental threat. Erosion control measures are being installed, but with variable success. How can we provide sound feedback on their effectiveness? Traditional techniques measure net soil losses captured downslope of the fields. What is actually needed is information within the fields on the spatial patterns of erosion and deposition. One possible strategy is to use fallout radionuclides to gain insight in soil redistribution as affected by the control measures. This helps to reveal their success or failure factors and provides evidence for improvement. Current research focuses on effects of agroforestry, non-inversion and strip tillage. If you want to know more about this, feel free to take contact. Hello, my name is Steven Sleutel. My research area is organic matter management in terrestrial ecosystems, in which we are looking to uh, changes in carbon flows in soils and ecosystems uh, as a function of global change, changing management and changing legislation. And we don't just look to the changing environment, but we also assess the impact of those changed carbon flows and related changed flows of nutrients on ecosystem functioning. Most of the research is applied, for instance we are looking at uh, recovery from acidification and how that is affecting DON and DOC transport into groundwater. And we also look to the soil phosphate uh, groundwater P status um, relationship on uh, a more regional scale and we're looking to the, the potential competition between organic matter and phosphorus in soils. More applied research is really on uh, stabilization mechanisms against microbial decomposition of organic matter in soils. We're also looking uh, at the visualization of soil pore structure and of rooting systems and then we're using that in our fundamental applied research. My name is Tina Kind and I'm the group leader of the research group Epigenetics and Defense at Ghent University Faculty of Bioscience Engineering. The research group Epigenetics and Defense is investigating the epigenetic regulation of the immune system of plants. All physiological mechanisms in living organisms are controlled by the activity of specific genes. Genes are part of the DNA, stored in the nucleus of all living cells. In a certain cell, a gene will either be switched on or switched off, depending on the necessity of that gene product in that particular cell. The on-off state of genes is determined by epigenetics. Literally, epigenetics means on top of the genes. Genes can be switched on or off by three main mechanisms. DNA methylation, histone modification and non-coding RNA-based regulation. Together, these processes are the control panel of our genes. Epigenetics is largely influenced by environmental factors. What an organism eats, where it lives, who it interacts with, 
to which stress factors it is exposed, as well as aging, can eventually cause epigenetic modifications around the genes that will turn them on or off. Although best known in animals, plants also have an innate immune system, which protects them from diseases caused by pathogens and pests. This immune system is controlled by epigenetics changes, which are being studied in the Epigenetics and Defense Research Group. We are focusing on the epigenetic mechanisms involved in the interaction between rice, one of the most important staple crops in the world, and disease-causing organisms, mainly the parasitic nematodes. These little worms are masters in the manipulation of the plant immune system to their own benefit, significantly weakening the rice plant and hence causing large yield losses in rice fields. Our investigations are done using different molecular techniques, as well as bioassays with plants and nematodes. In our research, we are trying to find answers to questions like How does a plant defend itself against pathogen attacks? To what extent and how do pathogens modify plant epigenetics to attain plant disease? And how can plant defense be enhanced by stimulation of the natural immune system? The ultimate goal of this research group, Epigenetics and Defense, is to teach our crop plants how to better protect themselves and hence to prevent crop yield losses in agriculture. Appelen, bioappelen 3,32 kilo, gewone appelen 2,77 kilo. Professor, u doseert in gewasbescherming. Is bio echt pesticidenvrij? Hulpstoffen zitten vaak al in de gewasbestrijdingsmiddelen. Ze kunnen ook apart aangekocht worden. Hulpstoffen bieden een aantal belangrijke voordelen. Doordat het gewasbestrijdingsmiddel beter tot de plant doordringt en zich beter vasthecht, is het mogelijk om er een lagere dosis van te gebruiken. Als de schone maand van mei, de akkers met jong groen bedekt. Komen spuitkarren gereden tegen onkruid en insect. Burkes, zet uw kranen open, dat uw zaaigraan goed rendeert. God, die alles hier doet groeien, wordt er bijer geassisteerd. En zo draait je de commerce, derde later is van geen talloos. Kinders komen straks ter wereld. Hi there. My name is Chris Oudnaert. I'm head of the Laboratory of Applied Mycology and Phenomics. Our laboratory is embedded in two main research consortia. The first one is Mytox on toxigenic fungi and mycotoxins. The second one is CropFit, a consortium on biostimulants for the agro sector. Research in the laboratory is based on four research pillars. First, we conduct surveys to monitor emerging toxigenic fungi in the field in European and African studies. Especially in Africa, fungal contamination in food commodities is a serious health issue. Secondly, we investigate the biological function of fungal secondary metabolites using a transcriptional engineering approach. Thirdly, we initiated research on the potential of new crop protection tools based on plant volatiles and beneficial endophytic fungi. Last, we also invested in a unique technology we call Phenomics, which will allow us to phenotype plant pathogen interactions in a high throughput manner using a robotized multispectral camera. This infrastructure will allow us to test new promising biostimulants or agrochemicals in diverse model plant systems. In classical food microbiology, man looks most of the time into the numbers and the identity of pathogenic microorganisms when we talk about microbial food safety. We, we go a step further. We go beyond that. We look into the virulence and the pathogenic properties of these pathogens. We want to characterize their ability to inflict the damage to human, animal, or maybe even plant hosts. This is the true information which is required for a meaningful risk assessment. And this is where we go to. 
I will walk you through some of the special techniques we use for these purposes as well as the techniques that we are really and truly willing to share with all the colleagues of the faculty. In fact, in many ways, we already greatly cooperate with so many of you. Join me. It is not only relevant information to know whether a specific microorganism is present in our food or water sample. It is also not only relevant to know whether it has a particular virulence gene. It is the complete relationship and interaction, a crosstalk between a pathogen and the human cell system that will describe and define finally the pathogenic response. To do this analysis at the transcriptomic level, we go to our Affymetrix Gene Atlas transcriptomic microarray system that can analyze more than 30,000 genes in one run and tell us what is the response of human expression profile in response to present microorganism or its toxin or for the same matter any other contaminant coming from the food or water. To relate what we have found on a transcriptomic level, we go a step further. We look into the functional properties of exposed cells. We can do this with a state-of-the-art Seahorse and Agilent extracellular flux analyzer. With this instrument, we can in real time measure the mitochondrial activity of the cells as well as their glycolytic activity. This gives us an information on number of key parameters that describe these two metabolic pathways. In such a way, we get an idea on something that we call functionomics, a functional properties of cells that were previously exposed to pathogens, toxins or contaminants. In combination, of transcriptomic with affymetrics. Functional properties of cells studied with a seahorse analyzer and for example mass spectrophotometric measurements we can give a completely new dimension into the metabolomics of cells as a response study to the toxins, pathogens, contaminants. You might not realize, but we use a lot of surfactants in our daily life when washing the dishes, washing our hands, or taking a shower. Those surfactants are petrochemical derived and end up in the wastewater. So in order to offer a more um, environmentally friendly alternative, I start working with yeast, which produces those surfactants on a biological and green process. Those surfactants are called sulfurolipids and have those restricted structure. Now, in order to even further broaden up the application potential, we develop modified yeast strains which produce different type of surfactants. Now, when doing so, we sometimes encountered uh, certain problems with getting the molecules out of the cells, which brings me to my second research interest, which is how can interesting molecules cross biological membranes. Now this is quite important because if things stay in the cell, you only have a few percentages of the cells in the liquid culture and the number of, I mean the amount of product in the cells will be even less, so you can have hardly 1% of product in there. Now if the product is taken to the outside world, to the extracellular environment, we have a huge space to occupy over here and you can get over 100 grams per liter. So really increasing your productivity. This is why we're working on the development of a tag for transport system to get molecules out of the cell in a very efficient way. Welcome in the laboratory of applied biotechnology or the LAB. There are some great people working here and they all focus on the synthetic biology of molecular proteins. They cut modular proteins in pieces, add some new pieces from other sources, reshuffle them and end up with new modular proteins that have a completely novel function or improved properties. I'm making customized antibiotics. I'm making new enzymes to produce prebiotics. I'm trying to make bioethanol. 
I'm creating enzyme cascades. There is even more. We are also making antivirals, pharmaceutical ingredients, diagnostics. There is so much you can do by building your own customized modular protein. I'm Willem Wagner and I would like to tell you something about data science. While data in fact is everywhere, with our phones we send messages on a daily basis, with uh, our cameras we take movies or we take pictures that we share with our friends, and when we do for example sports activities we have all sorts of devices that collect personal information like heart rate and speed. It's estimated that we use in total collect more than 2 quintillion bytes of data a day. That's a 2 with 18 zeros. In the research unit knowledge-based systems, we try to extract meaningful information out of this uh, bulk of data with a particular focus on applications in the life sciences. So take for example uh, this molecule here. It's a molecule that was uh, predicted by our mathematical models as a molecule with interesting uh, properties. Uh, this can be very helpful in, in drug design, for example, as a pre-screening tool prior to wet lab experimentation. The type of models behind are called machine learning models, because those models, they learn basically from data. We use those systems in other application domains as well, for example, in, in microbiology, in, in ecology, molecular biology, chemistry, geosciences, etc. Uh, we can even use machine learning methods to predict for you which ingredients make up a great new dish. Isn't that great? And I'm really sure this is only the start. I'm Sam Spielman, I'm professor at the Department of Agricultural Economics. My research field is economics and management of natural resources. Within this research field, I focus on three areas. First, the evaluation of the efficiency and the sustainability of natural resource use outcomes. Secondly, analyzing the management policies and institutions and their effect on the management of resources. And then thirdly, the valuation of natural resources and the services they deliver. As you can see, I'm standing here in front of the map of the world. This because most of my research takes place in the site. Not that we don't have natural resource management issues here in Flanders, but the reliance on natural resources for survival is much greater in the south, and therefore the sustainable management of these resources there is crucial of crucial importance there. So, I'm guiding PhD students from all over the world. For example, here in Vietnam, we are studying the environmental efficiency of cage lobster agriculture. And here in Myanmar, we are looking at the adaptation of smallholder farmers to climate change. 
In Ethiopia, we are investigating the factors determining the adoption by smallholder farmers of sustainable agricultural practices. And recently, in Ecuador, a PhD was started up that looks at evaluation of ecosystem services delivered by agriculture. As you can see, there's research going on in three continents. Finally, I'm also a member of the Natural Capital Platform at our faculty. Hello, I am Sven Mangelis and I lead the team within the Synbioc Research Group. Synbioc stands for Synthesis, Bioresources and Bioorganic Chemistry and in each of these fields my group is active. Within Synthesis we often prepare chiral building blocks for coupling reactions towards new amino acid derivatives and heterocyclic scaffolds with utility in agrochemistry and drug discovery. Selected bioresources, such as plants, bacteria or microalgae, are studied as source of bioactive natural products. In this way, we recently studied plant essential oils for control of insects, such as the mosquito malaria vector and phytochemical constituents of Chinese plants with reported anti-diabetic activity. Within bioorganic chemistry, we use chemical tools to provide molecular level insights into biological processes such as bacteria-host interactions. For example, we study how microalgae respond to chemical communication of bacteria or pheromones and why insect pests like Drosophila suzuki are attracted by bacteria which produce volatile compounds.